Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi, and hooray, it's Lisa Murphy. Yay! Yay! Nice to be here. Ah, always welcome, you know. I live, I just live in anticipation of you having an opening for recording. That's... <laughs> oh, oh, you've made my day. <laughs> um, but for real, I am glad that you're here. And um, uh, we're going to talk about... Um, teacher experience, experienced teachers. Um, what do you mean by experienced teachers, Heather? <laughs> well, I can't give it all away at the beginning of the show, but here okay. we'll just go ahead and do our quote. Um, so this comes from an article that actually was written in 1995. Um, and I read it originally as part of probably my master's degree coursework, but possibly my, my bachelor's. The title is Selecting Star Teachers for Children and Youth in Urban Poverty. And it's by uh, Martin Haberman. And um, I wanna acknowledge at the beginning that I, um, I understand that using the word urban in that context is um, not something that I, that I would probably, that I would do, or that maybe Martin would do now, since we've, think, we've, we've thought a little differently about um, the coded language that we use. Um, in working with children. So I want to acknowledge that from the beginning. Um, but here's our quote now that we've done that. Some teachers have 30 years of experience, while others have one year of experience 30 times over. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the end. The end. <laughs> How do we go? But I, so that, that really the first hit me. thing. Yeah, it, and it caught me too. And it was interesting because I, I read it right in preparation uh, yeah, for yeah. this. Also, because I'm, I'm, I don't know, I get, I get weird about out of the, out of context, yes, you know, yeah, so like, sure. let me read the whole thing. Yeah. So I, I read through it yesterday and I think I would have locked on that quote myself. From the whole thing. From, from the, the whole, whole article. thing too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There were, there were some definitely, definitely used some highlighter yeah. going, going through this one. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a lot in this article. We may touch on some of the other pieces, um, but, but really it's, it's, so this is something I think about a lot when, um, when I talk about how many years I've been in the field or when I, he, you know, anytime I hear that phrase, I think, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't always mean that you're good <laughs> or exactly. that you're, that you're doing what children need you to do to have a lot of years of experience. And um, I couldn't remember the article at that time. And so I Googled the phrase and I found the article, but I also found this might be also attributable to Stephen Covey. Um, mm -hmm. He talks about leaders having years of experience or one year, 30 times over. So I'm ah, not sure that, that, okay. that I get that in there also. For all um, your fact checkers. For the fact checkers, um, who uh, the three fact checkers who have emailed me fact checking things over the last five years of doing the podcast, six years. Um, so, so for me that, I mean, that's why it connected for me because people, I feel like really sit on that years of experience and use it to justify sometimes not having to change or not having to consider other ideas or, um, uh, not having to individualize for children, things like that. And I, I feel like mm -hmm. it's time to say years of experience does not give you a free pass um, True. or I does agree. not indicate knowledge, quality, you're good. skill. Yeah. Yeah. It made me, the, the, the first thing I thought about was my poopy face laminated lady that I had, that I was paired up with. Uh, probably most of the listeners have heard that story to some degree mm -hmm. of, you know, she had the 12 boxes on the shelf in the back of the room. And, you know, the, you know, the March, the March box would have been a uh, lifted off of the shelf this last week and the dust blown off and you know everything that you do every single march since she, she started teaching was in that box and i was thinking that's what came to my mind and and not as a not because i want a, an excuse to throw her under the bus mm -hmm. but just that you just it's you put yourself on rewind right like we went through the year we hit play in the beginning uh -huh. of the year and now we're rewinding and we do it again and we do it again and we expect then the same thing um, to be effective, to work. And, and I, I, I never had really stopped to, to think about that, mm -hmm. that it can often be maybe hidden behind as a free pass, you know, yeah. that I, I, I've been doing it for a while. So I clearly I, I'm doing it right because right. I'm still here. <laughs> um, 
And, yeah. and we all know that that's not true, right? That's pretty similar to saying that you're going to auto automatically be good because, you know, you've got a master's or mm -hmm. you've got a bachelor's and, um, and what are we calling experience? You right. know, that that's piece of that conversation as well. Yeah. And, you know, I have 30 years, I have more than 30 years of experience at this point. And, um, so does that mean I'm equal to every other person who has 30 years of experience and that we're all doing similar work with children and families? No, of course it does. No, it's not, right. <laughs> yeah. So what let's, I want to break it down for just a minute and talk about that idea of having one year of experience 30 times kind of specifically yeah. you taught, you started that with talking about laminated ladies, 12 boxes, one for each month. Um, I went into a program once to replace a teacher who'd been there for 30 years, 25 years, something like that. And there were boxes on the shelf and that the instruction left for me was, um, you should be able to pull these boxes off and have everything you need. So just tell your, tell your aide to get that box and set everything up and it should be real easy for you. Well, I'm not necessarily yeah. looking for easy for me. I I'm looking for, um, uh, what, what the children need, what, what these individual children need, which might be different than what children 20 years ago needed mm -hmm, from my, exactly. from my space and my practice. Well, and I think that, that, that then ripples out into so many other factors and factors that we, that even come up during workshop presentations mm -hmm. and the control piece. And by golly, you know, I spent, I, I spent six weeks getting the March box together. You're going to sit down and cut out this shamrock, um, you know, mm -hmm. and then, then thinking that we have, um, behavior issues or obedience issues. Yeah. When in fact it's children rebelling in a way that's 100% appropriate against some inappropriate expectations that sometimes do come with being there for so long. You yeah. know, I, I think the, the experience thing, like I said, it just, to me, it just ripples into so many other departments. You know, there's most programs have that matriarch of the school yeah. who's been doing something certain way and nobody wants to upset her. And because she's been here for 40 years, but at the end of the day, her practice has been one year that now she just keeps on repeat doing yeah. it over and over and over again. Um, but, but it hasn't kept up, right. It yeah. hasn't kept up with the time. She keeps clinging tightly to what worked you know, when the dinosaurs roamed <laughs> and, and the original time, dinosaur week. Yeah, really. <laughs> right. That's why she still has it because they were outside. Yeah. And, <coughs> and you know, I mean, and, and we've on our podcast have talked about, you know, it's a, it's a big day when you come face to face with the fact that some of the dogma that you've been holding tight to is no longer applicable yeah. or that it's outdated or yeah. that it's time to change your mind. And you know, perhaps come pay face to face with the fact that, that you are, you're not as experienced as your length of time in, so to speak, might apply to a general yeah. listener. Well, and so, so I think, I mean, definitely there are times when experience is a good thing, right? It is, it is proof that you've lasted, like you've, you've stuck to it. Um, you're committed to it. Um, hopefully still enjoy it. And that's why you're yeah. still there all those years later. But without, if your experience is, and maybe this is just saying the same thing a different way. If your experience is doing things always the same way with the same kinds of materials um, in the same order, a lot of times then, um, but you're not reflecting about it. You're not thinking about um, what worked, what's new, um, what, uh, what, uh, fits what I see this group's needs being like, I suppose it's possible to do 30 years of the same weekly themes. If what's happening within the theme changes a little bit. Yeah. But you'd like to think at some but point you, you were like, why am I still doing things? Right. <laughs> yes. I was just going to say asterisk. <laughs> we don't want you to do themes either, but, that <laughs> but if that's the case. Yeah. Um, but without reflecting and thinking and, and learning a little bit more that, that 30 years is not 
the compilation or the, yeah, the compilation that you think it is, it's, it's one thing over and over and over and over. And I think the reflection piece is probably crucial mm-hmm. to that. You know, are the, are the children like, cause I could, I could, I could see in, in my head, I can hear pushback against, well, well, but the kids all still like it. Yeah. Right. You know, nobody's pushing back. Yeah, but nobody pushing back might mean that, you know, the four-year-olds have already learned that compliancy is the is the right. name of the game and, yeah. and thinking is not mm-hmm. the rule of the game. So just sit still and glue the stickers on or whatever and, and get on with whatever's coming next yeah. or, or feel her wrath, unfortunately. So, oh my gosh, I just forgot the word that you even used that, that had me thinking um, work, work, you know, they, we say, well, it works. It still works 10 years later, 20 years later. How are we defining yeah. works or, yeah. or, or who, who is it working for? <laughs> like there's, there's deeper questions there. Um, and I, I just talked about this, um, with somebody maybe the day before yesterday that, um, trying to decide whether something works really is so dependent on that definition, right? So if, if compliance is, is what shows us that it works, or if children sitting and doing it is what shows us that it works, um, that's not, that's not good enough. Right. Um, or people will say, well, it works for most of the kids. There's just these two or three that it doesn't quote unquote work for. And then we assume that the problem is with those three because the 17 others are all going through the motions and participating in whatever our, our thing is. Um, instead of saying this wasn't smooth, everybody wasn't into it. Mm-hmm. It didn't work. <laughs> so what what needs to be adjusted or changed. And sometimes that's our definition of work that needs to be adjusted and changed. I I took a little note while you were talking that said that I I jotted down, having everything be so familiar allows us to avoid taking a risk. Mm. Yeah, unpack it. Safe, right? (laughs) This is safe. I know this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. So I just keep doing it because I don't want to upset my own apple cart. You know, I, I I might not want to come face to face with the fact that I'm actually not really that good. Mm -hmm. So I just keep doing what, you know, what I know. Yeah. Or I don't really enjoy it as much as I thought, because I'm not putting that ongoing effort into it. Um, I'm just bringing out the same old things because it's comfortable and easy and definitely safe. Um, and I, I can't help but think about teacher disposition and personality mm-hmm. style and and just that, you know, the character description of somebody who would have 30 years of experience as opposed to, you know, one year, 30 times mm-hmm. um, and curious. I mean, you know, at some point you, you like to think that you're like, you know what, that was always working <laughs> and, and it's not anymore, mm-hmm. you know, huh? Maybe I need to pay attention to that, which doesn't mean you're going to throw babies out with the bathwater and doesn't mean that you'd maybe even change your practice right away, but at least kind of going, huh, that's yeah. never happened before. Let's make a note of that. Let's yeah. see, see if there's other stuff that's not working. Um, yeah. One of, one of the other ways that I've heard it described by teachers, and it's often those matriarchs of the center or the, you know, the one who's done the 30 years is, um, well, children have just changed. And, and still the burden is on the children to fit me. Um, And, you know, maybe they have changed. The world has changed. The world impacts children. So, you know, maybe they are different now in ways from ways that they, they were 20 years ago, but we're not absolved from responsibility for figuring that out just because we say, well, I have 30 years of experience. This has always worked. Kids are just different now. Okay. Then they need something different from you. (laughs) Then we should be moving with them through that. And I was also, um, one of the things I love about being on, on your show is that I can come to the table with absolutely like no agenda (laughs) and and I can still, while you're talking, I get all these like insights, you know, and I, I love that. So thank you for that. Mm. What I'm thinking right now 
is that the closer we get programmatically to a play-based program and a real Mm play-based, not like that nonsense, you know, I had you stand up and clap your hands to the worksheet. Yes. That that kind of shit. But but a real play-based, but the closer we get to being facilitators of child-directed play, the more likely we are going to be people who have 30 years of experience because you're not falling back on those pre cookie cutter cut out things that all Mm -hmm. that um, third party curriculum, because you're having to pay attention. And so by observing, facilitating real time play episodes with the children who are here today, not the children who are here last year or who are going to be here next year, you, you have to almost develop Mm -hmm. that kind of temperament that is going to be more curious and more full of wonder and more, um, I, I keep coming back to curious, you know, mm-hmm. what, what, what is happening today and how come that did work? And, and how come all the kids seem to be really, really intrigued by something going on over there, you know? So my sense of curiosity and wonder is going to almost be, uh, like a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not like a, like an inoculation against mm. becoming that person who yeah. just wants to go on, on repeat yeah. all the time. It's going to be almost impossible to have that rewind, repeat, rewind, repeat mindset in a, in a play in a play focused program. Right. And especially when we think about, you know, definitions of play mm-hmm. being self-chosen, um, trying out your own ideas, intrinsically motivated if that's the space that we are creating and allowing for young children then it becomes about those children's ideas and if children change or we get a different group in it doesn't really change much for us because we're always we've we've been there to be supportive of children's ideas mm-hmm. and following their lead and supporting what we see and observe and and being curious and like you're like you're talking about but in the you know, for the, the 12 boxes, one for each month theme, that's all your idea. That's all the adult idea. Um, and so that would be hard to think about. I have to create a new January box every year because things might be different January 21 than January 22. Um, you just don't have to think about it in that way. If you're letting play happen and believing that play um, exactly. is, is and, a good and, thing. And that brings up the, like, why do we still think that it has to be complicated in order to be meaningful? Mm-hmm. Right. Cause nobody likes a martyr. You know, you reach a point where you're like, you know, I don't, yeah, I'm sorry. You spent all weekend cutting all that crap yeah. out. You I know, think the martyrs, like the, martyrs. <laughs> the, the martyrs like the martyrs, the martyrs, like the martyrs, the competition. Yeah. Yeah. I spent all weekend here getting this ready. Yeah. Well, well how sad for you and your family. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I think so, about that so, a lot, a yeah. lot, especially yeah. when, when I'm doing the being child centered workshop, because that's yeah. a, a lot of that. It's like, it's like, we've lost faith in the process of play and don't feel that we are then like, we're not worthy. Like we're, we're, uh, I'm not working hard. So clearly I must be a slacker and you're like, no, but it's a different kind of working hard. It's that observation and facilitating. It's not, it's being a facilitator instead of an instigator. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and all of that, those boxes is just nothing but doing to children. And, and I'm very grateful that I broke up with that as early in my career as I did, you know, and we still talk about before we knew better. And we all had that chapter where you were like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did that. Um, but then we let it go literally and, (laughs) and, and became okay with that. And, it doesn't mean you're not doing right. your job yep. just because you are, you're enjoying it yeah. and that you're not in the center of the room. Yeah. And if you feel pressure about other people looking in and thinking you're not doing a, your job, then you need to get better at talking about what your job is and what you were doing when they looked in and saw you um, 
just curiously we'll watching. We'll come back when children. you're teaching. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Back. Yeah. So um, this is completely unrelated. No, it's sort of related, but I, I, I'm more, I don't want it to derail the whole rest of the conversation, okay. but Keisha sent me this article last night, Keisha Reed, and it's like a, it's like a thesis, somebody's thesis, and I don't want to get into the whole thing, but they're talking about play-based learning. So they have to define play-based learning in the thesis. Uh-huh. And their definition was play-based learning has been defined as an adult-led organized and directed context for learning (laughs) through which children organize and make sense of their social worlds. Read that again. And that blew my mind. Play-based learning has been defined as an adult-led, organized, and directed context for learning. Huh. I couldn't even believe it that there's anyone who would define it in that way, but there's Uh, a citation. There's a citation for where that comes from. That definition comes from. I feel like my mouth was hanging open like a codfish because what that, that sounded like, like well, then opposite. Right. So no wonder it's such a hard fight sometimes if there are places, people, resources, defining it differently. And and I'll bounce back because I know what I'm about to say could take us on a a slippery slope, as I like to say. (laughs) But there is a really good article about, I think it's a blog post of why I don't like play-based learning. Yes, and I've seen it, that. And, it, and it's a nice clickbait, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, what? Yep. And of course, then what she's doing is saying how we've hijacked it, right? Yep. And we've talked about that numerous times. Yeah. And, now and I, I think- we call it play-based. So everybody thinks, oh, it must be good. And then it's, it's not play-based at right. all. Right. Yeah. I think you can just Google why I don't like play-based learning and find that blog. I remember yes. it. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to, so I'm going to circle back again for, for, uh, for the conversation that we were having before that, um, two things came to mind as you were talking. And one is that idea that if I'm not working hard, um, then I'm not really teaching. If I'm not, um, you know, the one directing most of this, then I'm not really teaching. And, um, in so the, one of the classes I'm teaching this semester is a curriculum in early childhood class. And so we're just reading lots of different things and they have, they eight o'clock in the morning, these students come with the greatest contributions to discussion. And it's they really, our morning people. It's really amazing <laughs> to me. Um, but anyway, uh, we had read something that said, you know, you don't need the most expensive toys. Sometimes a wooden spoon is all a child needs to whatever. And she So one of the students said, I really, that really stood out to me and I really liked it. Although I don't know that I would just give them a wooden spoon and leave it at that. (laughs) So I was like, why not? And and that's exactly what she was saying was that, well, that's not teaching them anything, just giving them a wooden spoon. I was like, well, you may not be directly instructing them about a skill by handing them a wooden spoon, but you are opening up opportunities for them to use that wooden spoon to learn about their environment, to learn from each other, to talk to each other, to invent ways of using things. Um, And she was like, oh. Like her mind blown. Yeah, and she hasn't, I mean, this student hasn't worked with children before. So, you know, she has no context, but that sort of everything must be educational um, idea that's sort of floating around in our cosmos over here. Yeah, I think the word teacher has a lot to do with it, but that's an episode, we can talk about that. Yeah, uh, you know, but but even to what you just said, the experience, right? So she's not had prior experience mm-hmm. with children, but now she's gaining some experience, mm-hmm. and you know, so at some point there's going to be like a, a catch up, right? A little bit of a learning curve, because mm-hmm. you can. Mm-hmm. You, I, I mean, I I guess you could go so far as to say that you could have five years of experience, but not any experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And an experience that maybe you wouldn't think would be applicable that very much is, Mm -hmm. you know, like I've been asked and and I talk about this sometimes in the workshop and people say, how long have you been in the profession? And you're like, that's a trick question. (laughs) You know, I'm the oldest of five. Uh Um, My mom did family childcare. I've been changing diapers since I was two. Uh I don't have any memories of not being around a horde of children. Yep, exactly. So does that count? You know, and then one time at a workshop, a lady said, well, how long have you been getting paid? Oh, And I'm like, 
well, oh. okay, <laughs> what are we calling paid? Because I made more per hour babysitting when I was in high school than I did my first few years out the gate working in a preschool. Yeah. You know, but does that all count? Mm -hmm. You know, and and again, for me, back to verbiage and all the regular listeners know, and you know that about me too, yep. but what are we calling experience? Mm -hmm. What what is what, what does that mean? Yeah. What does count? Mm -hmm. Um you know, did, did you have 25 years of, you know, no, no, one, two, three, crisscross applesauce, and then you changed your mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, that counts, Yeah, but, but, but it's if it's different. 25 years, it's <laughs> totally different, right? But that's a long chapter of before I knew better. Yes. Yeah. And for me, the biggest, I think the, well, one of the, the biggest reasons that this stood out to me, I think this quote is that, um, it really forced me to think about um, why couldn't it just be one year, 30 times over? Like what would, what's, what's the negative to that, which we've, you know, we've, we've hit on a couple of things, but um, one is that it just doesn't to teach evolve. the same way 30 times over it, it doesn't evolve. And it doesn't acknowledge that these are human beings that we're in, working with. It, it, it presupposes that this is a group that I can do things to and for. It doesn't allow that these are human beings and every human being is different. And um, last year's human beings will be different from next year's human beings. And um, I'm going to be a different human And being. I will be a different human being. <laughs> yeah. You hope anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. if you are not a personality that kind of has that disposition of, of being a, to use a, a, a catchphrase, to being a lifelong learner, mm -hmm. that's easier for you. You're yeah. going on autopilot. Yeah. Be because I'm going to, I to your first little statement there, <laughs> so, <laughs> what if it was one year on repeat? Okay, so if you think about it, if it was 100% play-based and my job is to be a facilitator, I mean, that could be a model. I mean, you're clearly going to be different within it. Yeah. But, you know. But maybe that's one year, 30 times over. One year of being a play, a playful, I don't even know, play-based teacher. Um, yeah, so I suppose this could be flipped around. <laughs> um, I guess it could be, but I mean, so, let's not confuse ourselves. No, let's not do that just yet. <laughs> Um, listeners can do that for themselves. That's their invitation. Um, that's their homework. <laughs> Write a little paper about that. When um, would that not be a good thing? Yeah. This morning we were talking about environments and um, uh, we watched a video, an interview with Sandra Duncan, who mm -hmm. has, um, you know, written lots of things, but also this book about design. And um, she referred to a study, and I, I haven't looked it up for the details, but it was at Northwestern University, and a teacher stood in his classroom on the first day of class and took a photo from each direction, facing each direction of the classroom, and he did that every month, the, the same classroom, the same four perspectives for the photo, and when he looked he at the at you know at the end of this he looked at all those photos, and I don't know what his study intent was, but this is what she what she shared from it. Um, nothing had changed in those photos from um, month by month going in four different directions. Everything looked the same. And yet he knew as a, as a teacher that the children who came in August would be changed by September and then changed even further by just by virtue of passing through time, interacting more with other people, having all these experiences they were physically, you know, the same children, but developmentally they, they were not, you know, it's not even this year is going to be different from next year. It's this month, this group is not what it will be next month when, when we've moved through some time together. And I thought that was just a really interesting, it, it sort of fit this, this idea of, you know, that, that was a year in his classroom, but how it was, does it not it change? Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand that. No, me neither. Huh? Interesting. Ah, I wonder what he was studying. Did he surprise himself? I wonder, right? I wish we should get him on the show <laughs> I have to research it. now. I'll go watch right? the video again and see go maybe it's in one video. of her books. Maybe I'll just message her <laughs> yeah, and see. 
That would be very curious. Um, I, I, I'm also having a thought about um, when it comes to environment um, and, and how many how many hours are wasted that getting back and getting ready for the kids to come back from school. And, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that, that I typically say a lot in August is just set out the bones and leave it alone. <laughs> if you're here for 80 hours this week, you're gonna have all that time and energy and ego invested. And then when you realize after those 20 kids walk in that the blocks need to be moved and the book area needs to be moved, you're gonna be like, no, yeah. dang it. I was here all week. And that's where I think it works because yeah. it looks pretty. Yeah. And and I always tell them just set it up, set up the bones and leave it alone and let the children show you where, where things those, need to where be. Where those need, things need to change. And, and because yeah. you're not exhausted from, you know, trying to get it perfect and staying here until midnight for five days in a row, you're going to have the time and the intent, the inkling to be, to be okay mm -hmm. with that. And, you know, I, I think a, a piece of this conversation is my favorite F word, which is flexible. <laughs> you know, if you're not bringing that flexibility yeah. to the table, if you are bringing more of a rigid control style persona, I think just your default is going to be executing the same thing every year yeah. because, you know, I'm the boss of it then yeah. and I, it's predictable and, you know, with, don't fix it if it's not broken, you know. <laughs> I, well, that's so that's the uh, that's what I was just thinking that don't fix it if it's not broken, even saying, you know, have you done have you had 30 years experience? Have you had the first one year 30 times over that one year could have been really good. Like it doesn't necessarily follow that that one year was bad practice or inappropriate or whatever, True. but it it just means it was it was what you did at that time for that. Yeah, but good for moment. who, though? Yeah, and that too. Good for who? That too. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think like when I was at uh, Purdue in the preschool, that's the closest I've gotten to just being able to have a truly fully play-based. Um, well, there's your answer. Is it? Because I was going to talk more. <laughs> oh, well, no, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a thumbs up. Yeah. So that was, you know, I felt, I felt good about it. It was working for me because I want to be that kind of teacher it was working for the children in the sense that they were engaged and excited and um, learning. Like we could see that they were developing over time. Um, we'd had very few behavior issues, um, but I changed things all the time based on something new I'd learned, something I was thinking differently about, something I saw the children not interested in anymore. Um, or something, you know, I heard them mention that I wanted to bring in. Um, so even though I felt like that one year was probably a, okay, I'm still not going to be satisfied or feel like it's effective to keep doing it that way over and over and over. Yes. And because <laughs> it got so close to that play, I think that's Kind of the, the point that we were making you know a, a little bit ago mm -hmm. that, that you it, it the the model might be something that's repeated right the, the, yeah. no no not even model strike that uh -huh. just get race uh -huh. the philosophy yeah the philosophical orientation is going to perhaps be consistent year after mm -hmm. year but within the application or execution of that orientation that's going to different because the children are going to be different. Right. Yes. I was trying to find something. I know we, we weren't really using this article much, but there is something, there was something where he talked about ideology being more important than teaching strategies or teaching techniques. Yeah. That was actually number one. Hold on. He said that you couldn't, um, it's in the second paragraph. My point here is that teachers' behaviors and the ideology that undergirds their behaviors cannot be unwrapped. Mm -hmm. They are of a piece. Yeah. Cannot be unwrapped. They are of a piece. Yeah. So I think. If that's hmm. what you were. If yeah. That's now I'm wondering where I was going with is what I was thinking well, of. it's the philosophical <laughs> orientation, right? I, it, right it's yes. making sure that we're consistent. If yeah. I'm saying that I believe in this, but my practice is different, then it's like, wait a minute, you're totally mm -hmm. contradicting. You're contradicting yourself there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, back to that idea that if you feel like 
you have to be working or every, it has to be evident to everybody that you've done a lot of work, then you just need to practice talking about your well, ideology and where it's coming from. And, and I, I think it does, um, my thought when I was reading that was one, the consistency piece, which mm -hmm. is so important, but that also, um, when I say that I'm child centered and when I say that I'm play-based, like my mood has nothing to do with whether or not I I'm holding still true to that belief system and to uh -huh. that value system. And, um, you know, it's not like I'm only play-based and child centered when I'm in a good mood or <laughs> on Wednesdays, yeah. you know, because that's half day. Uh -huh. Um, it's all the time. And, and I, think, although for me, that's like a duh, you know, of course that would be, you know, the same onstage persona as your offstage, right? It's like the same, like this is guiding my work, not just in certain situations. Mm -hmm. um, I, and for me, where I was going with that was that like, for me, that's like, like, well, of course, right? Like, isn't that for everybody? And, and maybe, maybe it's just not, you know, if that, cause if, let's say if you don't bring that play oriented focus to an environment, but now you're working at a place that does like, there's going to be a while there where you're kind of maybe having to put that hat on yeah. during your shift because it hasn't yet spilled over. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I guess it could go the, the opposite way, way as well too, yeah. you know? Yeah. I was thinking about, um, Lillian Katz's stages of teacher development too. And there's that, that final piece I think is consolidation. No, well, there's renewal. So it's like survival and then consolidation. I don't know. Maturity and renewal, something like that. But, you know, she makes it clear that these are not, it's not linear. It's, right. you know, some teachers might get to uh, consolidation and move no further where they're, and some might just stay in survival where they're just doing the basic to get through their days. Um, but it's when we can get to the point where we start to think about what's happening and apply new information to our work. And it's that lifelong learning, whether it's formally or informally, um, that get us from from out of being stuck in one of the stages. And uh, so I, I feel like that was sort of what that one year, 30 times over could be too, is a teacher who's just stuck in a stage. Yeah. yeah. And it's possible they've never been presented with another way to think about things, but um, I don't know that that's uh, the most common reason <laughs> that people just do the same. Don't you take my March box away from me. <laughs> That's yeah. my March box. Yeah. The March box. Well, and, and, and I think, I mean, is the thought of not having a, a March box maybe really overwhelming and scary, mm -hmm. you know, because it does then imply that I'm going to be trusting the children or mm -hmm. trust that I can reflect on my need to play teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what, what does that look like? I mean, you know, sometimes it's scarier to, to not change or, you know, you, no, no. My thought about what might happen scares me more than, oh, I'm just going to stay here. I'm yeah. They stuck here. Cause I don't know what's on the other side. Yeah. So even if you started to <clears throat> question the boxes, just to keep that metaphor going. But if you were to question it, there might be like, oh, well, I know I'm, I know I shouldn't, but it's become habitual, right? It's mm -hmm. because it's, it's what I know. It's, yeah. it's what I know. And, and what I don't know is a little too overwhelming or scary. Right. And, and, and safety and security is a basic need, right? It's, we go to, go to, go to Maslow and we yeah. have to have that, that Triangle. basic need. Um, and then we can, we can, you know, maybe move out of it as we feel more secure, but um, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to ever do that if we don't take a step <laughs> out of that, um, out of that realm. So how about a, this is sort of a more practical response that, that I could imagine someone giving for doing the same thing over and over every year and using the same materials and the same themes and those kinds of things. We don't have any planning time. We don't get any paid planning time or the only now time go we right have to, to work on it is nap time. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to hear you go about this one now. Well, because you're not planning. 
in for anything if you're a play-based program. I mean, you're not. You're not sitting down once a month doing that horrible ritual that we all have put our time in doing that. Yes. Oh, I mean, yes. I remember oh. that when I was. I used to really love it. I had cute notebooks for it. And I had, oh. you know, I felt like a teacher when I did my lesson plan. Right. It, but I lost a weekend. Yeah. Oh, no, can't do that. I got a lesson plan next weekend. You know, like, <laughs> oh, and you sit down and you fill in all the boxes and stuff. And, you know, I mean, it was a big day when I was had that first like how the hell am I going to know what the kids are going to be interested in? That was a big <laughs> moment. Yeah. We're like, hi, I never really stopped to think about that mm -hmm. before, but yeah. So it's, it's, there's reflecting, right? Cause I know somebody's going to be like, what do you mean? No lesson plans where I'm like, okay, just, yeah. You're reflect <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Whether it's a formal reflection time, whether, you know, you, you do get compensated maybe for a 30 minutes, that last 30 minutes where you can go sit in the break room or at the kitchen or in the bathroom and, and journal or write down yeah. or capture, you know, what did happen today? You know, what, where was I challenged? What, what did work? What mm -hmm. didn't work? And, and how am I now going to use that information in order to guide my facilitation tomorrow? Yeah. But if you have set up the space, the bones are there. And when I say bones, I'm saying, you know, you've got the stuff right you got the blocks and you got the easel and you got a book area and you got you got the stuff and my job is to stand at the door and say good morning come on in because we're ready for you and mm -hmm. we've been waiting for you and come on in come on in there's I, I have no intention to be teaching anybody anything today no. I I'm not thinking about um <clears throat> what we have to hurry up and, and, and finish in order to get to circle time. Yeah, My yeah. job is to be 100% in the moment facilitating that. So there's no need mm -hmm. to make those boxes. Yeah. And I, I think there's a difference between pre-planning a curriculum and being intentional about your choices and the space that you set up. And, sure. and, and that's hard for some people. So what I, what I've asked people to do at different times when I was, you know, a supervisor or director or whatever, is to just put the blank form on the, on the wall and let the children go through their day and do a playful day. And you can still write down things in every box. Of course. Um, and then you can look at that and see, okay, so what might we add tomorrow or what might I, um, uh, want to really watch for tomorrow and how can I use this? So there's still an element of planning quote unquote and again it's that verbiage right yeah, so what yeah. do we mean by planning like yeah. if, if if somebody's definition of planning is that i'm filling in boxes yeah i'll plan you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> your bad self out yeah but, but give me the parameters of what you see in your head am i going to expect staff at this point to sit down once a month and fill out stuff and then execute it and then beat themselves up and get frustrated if they didn't get to what was right. on the plan right no yeah. No. And no. I've, I've been in so many classrooms and I know this is another one where listeners will be like, oh, not me, but I've been in so many programs, classrooms, even home, you know, homes that do their weekly lesson plan and then don't do anything with it, but it's posted and I did it. Um, hoop and, jumping. Yeah. So I've jumped through the hoops and, um, I guess that's a different approach than the, the 12 boxes. And I do the same things over and over again. It's two sides of a uh, frustrating coin, I guess I'll say, but I, I just know that a lot of times we do it because we feel like we have to do it. We don't really have to do it. You don't have to do it. You know, I, I would rather have reflective teachers mm -hmm. than, than people who put up really, you know, cute Pinteresty um, lesson plans on, on the wall, but then mm -hmm. either are tuned out the whole day, just going through the motions, right? Yeah. Okay. Check, 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 check it off the list. Yeah. But it wasn't relevant and it wasn't real and it wasn't meaningful and relationships were not nurtured and deepened, right? right. Because we we're so busy focused on staying on schedule. So it didn't work <laughs> <laughs> for, for that, for the other definition of does it work? In yeah. that case, you're describing a, a program. But to somebody that walking worked. by, it, it looks like, like it it's working. working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, um, you know, I think another, I guess another reason I could imagine for someone just wanting to do the same thing over and over all the time is that they're one of those folks. And, and again, there are people in this field that this is true of. 
even if it's screaming, not me in your head while you hear this. Um, there are people who come in and choose the work because they like notebooks and they like bulletin boards and they like cute decorations and they like cutting things out and it's their personality, not necessarily expertise or skill or knowledge that they bring to the work. And I think those folks are going to be more likely to just repeat the same year 30 times over than to teach truly 30 years Mm -hmm. in the field. Yes. I was having a half baked thought. (laughs) So was I, but I said mine out loud. (laughs) Well, no, mine was in response to that. Um, I, I, I rewrote one of my, uh, one of the articles for the, for the new website. Yay. Oh, yay. New <laughs> website. <laughs> same, same name of the website, all new look shiny yeah. and new. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things I talked about in there was how, um, I think some it's, a, it's a longer half baked thought, but it goes back <laughs> to the bulletin boards and the liking of the yeah. notebooks, things like that, because, uh, oftentimes as adults, we can only get so far back in our memory bank mm-hmm. of our own educational experience. Right. Right. So oftentimes when we think about teacher, teaching, school, mm-hmm. we can get back to maybe second grade, third grade. Not a lot of people can get before that. So we have people who have chosen now to work with young people whose last real mem- memory was of a third grade teacher. Right. And a third grade and, classroom. And a third and, grade classroom. Yeah. And so that's what we end up. I mean, it's like we're I don't want to say arrested development because that's not what I'm saying, but it's like, that's where we fix it. That's, that's our mm-hmm. memory, our memory, mm-hmm. our memory. And then that's what we end up putting out. And we forget that, of course, working with a third grade group of children is quite different than Very a different. Room full of three and two and, and, and one-year-olds. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there's, there's room to kick that around a little bit, yeah. a little bit too. Maybe there was a teacher that we really, really liked and she had boxes. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe I was the kid in the class who I, I, I liked what was in those boxes, yeah, right? Exactly. Because Lisa, maybe- you are, you are just repeating almost everything I said to one of my classes yesterday. <laughs> this yeah. is so eerie. This like is so maybe the only I time before. I got to ever use glue yeah. was when Poopy Face brought the box down. <laughs> And so yeah. I don't mind. I didn't mind the boxes. Yeah. I, I, you know, maybe we my have. memory is one of not feeling like I was just doing it because I didn't want to go to the timeout chair, but I was doing it because it was, it was fun for me. Um, yeah. So th- there's, there could be a whole bunch of probably reasons. Yeah. There's also a quote I saw a couple of weeks ago. It was probably just like a Facebook, Facebook quote kind of thing that I scrolled through and it was something about how, um, one of the one of the things that gets in the way of improving spaces for children early childhood education or schools um is that most of the people doing the teaching were good at school in the traditional sense Uh, and so mm -hmm. it's hard for us and that's kind of what you're describing that's our memory um and that's what we were good at and we enjoyed it because we were good at it um, so a lot of times those are the, those are the folks who are really resistant to thinking about a different way of doing it. Um, not impossible and not from any sort of selfish intention, but it's just, our brains are weird. <laughs> well, and all of this to say that the self-reflection piece is important. You know, the, I don't want to say working on our own stuff, but, but that is a piece of it. Yeah. And, and what are we bringing to the table um, psychologically and spiritually and experience wise? And, and are we recreating patterns because they're familiar, but maybe not necessarily really what, what the situation requires and, and being willing to, to engage in that piece of it. And, you know, now I feel like Tamar should be here where I always feel like I'm channeling Tamar <laughs> Jacobson when I start talking about that, you know, and, and, and my one, God love this. One of my favorite professors from my undergrad who used to say your psychic chickens come home to roost in your marriage. And, oh. and that's the same. I, isn't that great? Yeah. And not psychic, like psychic, right. but like your psychological chickens mm-hmm. are going to come home to roost. And I would say 100% still an accurate quote for people in this profession. Mm-hmm. 
You know, you, you don't often even realize that you've got stuff that needs some attention until you hang out with toddlers for a week. And you're <laughs> like, wow, I'm a little wound up. <laughs> Who knew yes. that I was a control freak? <laughs> right, exactly. Why like- does nose picking <laughs> bother me so bad? It's like before we started recording and you asked me if I was crabby and I was like, I haven't really interacted with anyone yet. So I don't know. (laughs) Maybe I am. Yeah. yeah. Say something, Lisa. Let's see. (laughs) How below the surface is it today? (laughs) Is it right there? (laughs) I don't feel crabby right now. We'll see. We'll see. It's because you had that big long laugh right there. That's why all those endorphins are pumping through your body right now. For sure. I do love a good endorphin. (laughs) Who doesn't? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, So we have really, I think, covered so much. Is there anything else we need to, to, no, I, I, I always love the note. You're the note writer. Um, I, I mostly used highlighters. I mean, and, and, and I, I do, uh, with you appreciate that this article was written quite a few years ago. Um, but, uh, still has good stuff. I think there was some good stuff in there that you could probably go back and unpack. And, and the nerd in me, of course, was impressed by the fact that, that he was claiming, at least at the time, that he has figured out a way to interview in order to weed out people who don't bring right. some that's- of these variables. And, and I was quite impressed with uh, that's a that's a hefty claim. He talked about selecting rather than training. Correct. And I think that goes, that's sort of the opposite of what I, this is a whole other thing, but opposite, you know, I always thought if you're trainable, come on in, I can train you. Well, I agree with that, but you still have to want to be there. Right. So that disposition piece. Right. There's still some selection, I guess, that you have to pay attention to. Yeah. Well, that's another, that's another conversation. (laughs) Um, Okay. Well, this was great. Thank you, Lisa. It's always so Thank much you. fun. Always. Um, fun. Yeah. And thanks everybody for listening. We'll be back again next week for another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. Bye-bye. Goodbye.